All right. Okay, Margie comes up now and does a little presentation we call it for the young or young at heart. So whether uh, 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 there are young of years watching at home or whether they're just young at heart here, we are all good for this. So go ahead, Margie. Okay, we've got somebody, some young person coming in back there. Any, any of you heard about the Iditarod? <laughs> I am an Iditarod fan. And I love watching the progress of the mushers, the people that drive the sleds at the Iditarod. And I've watched, I watched it for about 12 years. I got into it through a teacher friend of mine that was watching it with her classroom. And I got excited about it and started watching it every year. And one year I thought, I want to go there. I want to go to Nome and see them come in under the burled arch there and I had some favorite mushers at that time and I wanted to see them come in so uh, but I didn't have any warm clothes for that kind of thing so I had to kind of start scouting around and trying to find something that could be warm because it gets cold there in Nome where they come in and so I started finding all the right gear the boots and the warm double layers of pants and underneath stuff too. Good morning. How are you? Anyway, it is, uh, it was real exciting to go there and be there, but it was cold and I was glad I had all of those nice warm things. Something happened there. I lost one of my mittens. I, it had actually gotten warm enough one day I'd taken my mittens off. And uh, I had, I thought I had them clipped on to me, but one wasn't, I guess. And here I had one, but not the other. And I had just bought them. They were brand new. What do you think I did? I prayed. Does God care about even a new mitten, a lost mitten? He sure does. I looked all over Nome. I went asking everywhere, and I couldn't find that mitten. So I was just about thinking, I guess I've lost it when all of a sudden I was making one more check down the front street where I had walked. And a, and a um, policeman was parked along the side as I came along. And he rolled down his window. He said, you look like you're looking for something. I said, I am. I had some new gloves, mittens, and, and I can't find one of them. And all of a sudden he held up one. He goes, would it happen to look like this? <laughs> and I said, yes, that's mine. And he said, oh, I'm so glad. I've been trying to find who lost it. So that's neat how God even cares about a new set of mittens, doesn't he? <laughs> One lost mitten. Anyway, it was a real neat experience, but it helped that I had all these nice warm things on. This morning, from the book of Revelation, we're talking about cold and hot and lukewarm. Can I have your help? Would you come up and help me? Good. I want you to stick some fingers in there and tell me what that feels like. Just warm, huh? It's not too hot and it's not too cold. Oh, wait. Go into the white freezer in that room, please. Not you, sweetie. Him. <laughs> I forgot something in there. It's in the door, Lee. Okay, and now... I will have you fill this one. This is called a hot water bottle. Put your hand in there on top of that. How does that feel? Okay, but do you know why it's warm to you? Because you're touching the outside, but do you know how it has to be warm to you to touch out here? It has to be very hot inside. So that is very hot. And I had it on the hottest turn when I turned it on just out there a few minutes ago. So it's very hot inside. Okay, thank you so much. You were my lifesaver. <laughs> okay, now fill those. What do those feel like? Cold. Oh, cold, cold. <laughs> yeah, because these have just been in the freezer. So, cold, and these are warm, and this is very hot. Okay. If you want to, you can sit down here now if you want. And I'll even let you. 
hold my little sled dog, okay? But when it's cold, well, let's start out the opposite way. Okay. Jesus says in the book of Revelation that he wants us to be like the water that's in the hot water bottle. He wants us to be hot with our love for him. Hot with dedication that makes us want to open this book, the Bible, every day and read love letters from him and talk to him in prayer and pray for people to share his love with so they won't have to feel uh, like they don't need him to. That's hot, what Jesus wants us to be. This lukewarm that she taught, touched that's just not real hot, not real cold, just kind of medium, Jesus says is the people that think they're pretty cool, I'm doing all right, I don't really need God, I have a nice car, nice home, nice clothes, I have, I'm comfortable. I really don't feel like I need that guy God too much. How does God feel when we think that way? Do you know? Do you know what this is? A thermometer. And it helps you know whether you have a fever and you're really sick or whatever. Well, Jesus feels really sick when we think we don't really need him. and We're just kind of lukewarm in our love for him makes him feel like he's going to, like he's very sick. He's sick at heart because he wants our love and our attention and devotion and dedication to him. So he feels sad about that. And the Bible actually says it makes him feel like he's going to throw up. Do you like to throw up? I don't either. And I don't like to think of what, that if I was lukewarm, I'd be making him feel sick. I wouldn't want that. And I don't think you would either. So we don't want to be lukewarm. I have this little thing here, a little faucet. If I want to do hot, what do I need to do? You show me. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that would be hot. What if I wanted cold? Okay. Good. And what if I want warm? What do I have to do? Good job. She's sharp. How old are you? What? Great. Yes, that's warm. But what did we want to be? Wants us to be hot with our love for him, right? Now, he said something kind of interesting. Cold stands for the people that aren't really interested in him. They just have no time for God at all. The lukewarm people are kind of, they know about him, but they don't feel like they need him in their life. But Jesus said, if you're not hot with your love for me, I want you to be cold. I'd rather you were cold. Why would he say that, I wonder? You know why? It was cold this morning, wasn't it? You've got a jacket on, and a little bit ago, I was wearing a jacket, and oh yes, that felt so much better. Because when you're cold... You know you want to do something to get warm, right? To get hot. I wanted to get hot, so I got my jacket out, and I wore it when we came this morning because I was cold. And I don't like to be cold. I want to get hot again. And most of all, I want to get hot with my love for Jesus. Hot in my dedication and communion and just wanting to be in a loving friendship forever with him. That's what I want. And that's what he wants for each one of us, too. And you know what? How we get that way. Kind of already mentioned it, but it's about reading about his love letters and the Bible every day. That's how we get to know about him. Talking to him in prayer so that we can be talking to him about things we're thinking about the way we talk to a friend and we can be listening to him as he talks back in different ways he does through the bible and other ways too nature and other ways and then praying for people to spill over and share with his love for him that's how we get close to our best friend jesus every day that's how we stay 
hot with him. What do you think you want to be? You want to be hot for Jesus? Me too. Let's pray. Thank you, dear Jesus, for caring about each one of us and and wanting us to be hot with our love and devotion and friendship with you. That's what I pray for each one here this morning, that we would be so interested in a forever friendship with you that we would want to stay connected and close to you each day. Please save us from thinking we don't need you. Save us from thinking we don't want you. And help us to be your forever friends. Today, tomorrow, and every day until you come and take us home is my prayer. We don't want to make you sick, Jesus, so please keep us tight with you. We love you. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming up and being my helper. Okay. I want to have one more prayer, so let's do that. Lord Jesus, we want to ask for the Holy Spirit to move among us, not just in the room, but in our hearts and minds. We want to look your direction in your word in this book, Revelation. We want to see you there. We want our hearts to be drawn more closely and loved with you. And so we just pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start by telling you a little story. Uh, Many years ago when I was a kid, uh, my father pastored a church in Colorado. Grand Junction, Colorado was the name of the town. And there was a, a couple in that town uh, by the name of Johnny and Ann. Uh, Johnny and Ann. Huh? Ward. Yeah, Ward. I almost forgot I did when Margie had to help me out. Johnny and Ann Ward. Anyway, every springtime at their home, they hosted a, for the whole church family that wanted to come out, they hosted a strawberry shortcake feed. So it was a social, and they had the first strawberries of the season, and they would make homemade shortcake, and they would have a social together, and then they would serve this. Well, uh, Johnny was good friends with a guy named Ward Stute, Dr. Stute. Oh, it's Watson. That's what it was. Johnny and Ann Watson, and then Ward is the name of the doctor. Um, anyway, Ward Stute was the doctor, and he and Johnny were good friends, but they always loved to play practical jokes on each other. And so they were each always trying to outdo the other in, in a joke on, on, on the one. And so anyway, at this particular church social, uh, Johnny went into the kitchen where the shortcake was being prepared to bring out and serve to the guests and the church members that are there for the social. And instead of putting whipping cream on top of the one he gave to Dr. Stute, he put shaving cream on top. And he swirled it around nice and you know curvy and came up with a cute little tip on the end. It looked just as good as the other. And then they, he, then he was serving the guests. Well, when it came to Dr. Stute, he gave him the one with the shaving cream. And Dr. Stute took his, thanked him very much. And everybody was eating their shortcake. And they were all commenting about how delicious it was and how they always looked forward to the spring uh, church social at the Watson's home. And they asked uh, uh, Anne uh, if she could share the recipe for her special shortcake that she'd made. And many commented and asked what was the uh, mystery flavor in the whipping cream. Did she put more vanilla in it than usual or what? It was so good. And Dr. Stute, he's eating his, took his a bite out of his, and he thought, this is horrible. This is, he, I, I can't, people are talking about how good it is. I don't know what's wrong. I wonder if there's something wrong with me. And so he concluded, since everybody else was so delighted with their whipping cream and their shortcake, that it must be something going weird with his taste buds. So he ate the whole thing. He ate the whole thing without saying a word, um, but it didn't make him feel very good to have all that shaving cream in his stomach. Well, the social ended and he went home, had a rotten night. He had indigestion and he got up halfway through the night. He was just sicker than can be. And he called Johnny in the middle of the night and he said, Johnny, I I hate to call you in the middle of the night, but has anybody else called? He said, I think it's something I ate. I think it was in the whipping cream. I'm not sure, but did anybody else call uh, concerned about not feeling good tonight? And Johnny laughed and he said, no, nobody else would call because nobody else had whipping cream and and they had shaving cream. instead of whipping cream. You're the only one. And so then Dr. Stute realized that he just had a joke played on him. Um, and it, maybe he blew bubbles the rest of the night. I don't know. But the point of that story is the whipping cream that was not really whipping cream, the shaving cream, it looked like something it wasn't. It looked like something 
it wasn't. And we're going to see how that ties into our presentation for this meeting this morning as we look in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation. Our title for this presentation, as Margie already mentioned, is Hot, Cold, or Warm? Question mark. And we're going to look in Revelation chapter 3, up here on the screen, verses 14 to 15. Um, Excuse me, I, I forgot to put that slide up when you were doing it. Okay, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now notice what he says to them. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. So they're not cold and they're not hot. They're neither one on either side of the extreme. And he's writing this. This is a message to a church. The church is the church in, in a town called Laodicea, and the people of the town are called Laodiceans. Um, and so anyway, he says, I know your works. You're not cold. You're not hot. And then he says something interesting. He says, I wish you were one or the other. I wish you were cold. I wish you are. I wish you were hot. Now, why would God prefer that they would be cold over being warm? Because they're, the, they're in the middle. Margie mentioned a few moments ago, when you're cold, you want to get hot, don't you? But if you're warm, you're not thinking about changing. You're like, I'm comfortable. I'm not so sure I need anything. This, this, is, this is perfectly fine. Someone says to you, is it too hot in here or is it too cold in here? Do you need the heat on? Do you need the air conditioner? I say, no, I'm just, I'm just fine. Oh, don't, don't mess with anything. It's all good. So God's looking at this group of people. And he says, you think you're fine. You're right in the middle. You're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. Obviously, he would prefer that they be hot because hot would represent being close to him and being all fired up with, with love for, for God. But, but, but then the other extreme, cold. If you're not going to be hot, I wish you were cold, he says. Uh, how did he feel about lukewarm? Let's keep reading verse 16 in Revelation 3. So then because you are lukewarm, middle, not neither hot or cold, um, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. Now, if I was to paraphrase that, I would say this. God is saying, you know what? Since you're neither cold nor hot, you just make me want to throw up. You make me sick. I feel sick to my stomach. Well, so this group of people, they give God the urge to regurge. And um, he tells them, I wish you were one or the other. Why does he wish they were one or the other? Let's keep going. Verse 17, he says, here's the deal. You say I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need anything. What you don't realize is that you're actually wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So you think you're okay. But actually, you're in a heap of trouble, and you just don't even realize it. I wish you realized your real condition. They think they're okay. They don't think they need anything. Now, are these first few verses here that we've just looked at, Revelation 3, verses 15 to 17, or 14 to 17, are these, are these verses where you say that God is giving, paying them high compliments? I don't think so. This is not uh, kudos to the church of Laodicea. Uh, he's telling them we have a problem. Mich what is it? Uh, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, now, let's think a little bit about this group of people. This is the rebuke. This first few verses is what we're going to call the rebuke to the church of Laodicea. We have a problem, the rebuke. There's trouble here. Now, let's just think a little bit more about this church of Laodicea. How do you get lukewarm? You saw Margie had uh, a few minutes ago, if you were here when she was doing the, she had the, uh, faucet. And we have a picture of it on the screen as well. And uh, what, what's the little girl's name? Isabel? Okay. And Isabel was clever and she knew exactly how to answer these questions, each one. She got it all right. Um, but Margie said, if you want hot, how do you get it? And Isabel turned that one. So you turn that one all the way to the, on and you're going to get hot. At least that's the way it's supposed to be. And Margie said, well, how do you get cold? Well, Isabel said, turn the other one on. That's how you get cold. And then she said, how do you get in the middle? How do you get warm? And Isabel went like that. She had it right. You know, it can be kind of frustrating if you've ever been at a place where they have the, the plumbing backwards. Have you ever been in one of those situations? I was taking a shower at somebody's house. They had the plumbing backwards. And I was feeling like the water was colder than I wanted. And so I thought, well, I'll just turn on a little more hot. And boy, I'm telling you, the hot was cold and the cold was hot. So when I turned on the hot a little more, thinking I was going to get warm from the cold water, I increased the cold. And if I had been singing at the time, I would have been singing a note higher at that point um, with a lot more enthusiasm and gusto, probably. Um, but anyway, uh, to get lukewarm, it's a combination of hot and cold. That's how you get lukewarm. Let's just think a minute about now, how does that apply to this church that Jesus refers to as 
Laodicea. Um, what makes them lukewarm? How do you be, spiritually speaking, halfway hot and halfway cold? How do you, what does that, what does that mean? In Matthew 23, Jesus talks to a group of church leaders and he calls them hypocrites. Now, I'll just look at this for a minute and then we're going to tie it back to the church of Laodicea. He says to them, woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, notice what he says next. You are like whitewashed tombs which look beautiful on the outside. So he says, you look okay. You look pretty good from the outside. But then he goes on. He says, but actually on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. So he's saying, you look good, but you're actually, actually rotten on the inside. He calls them hypocrites. In the same way, he says, on the outside, you appear to people as though you're righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. These people that Jesus is talking to here, he said, you search the scriptures because in them you think you have eternal life, but these are they which testify of me, and yet you don't come to me that you might have life. So is it possible to know a lot about the Bible and not know Jesus? Apparently it is. And Jesus is saying to those people, you hypocrites, you call yourselves Christians, but you have nothing to do with Christ. You've memorized doctrine, but you don't know the doctor. And he says, this is not a good thing. This is a problem. They look good on the outside, but on the inside, they're rotten. The church of Laodicea has what looks like good works. They know how to act but they have bad hearts. Inside, they're not dialed in. They're not really connected. They don't have a meaningful relationship with God. They're just going through the motions. Um, they know the rules, but they don't know the ruler. They know the laws, but they don't know the Lord. They know the facts, but they don't know the friend. They have weekly time for church, but they have no daily time for Jesus. They show up at church once a week, but in terms of spending any kind of meaningful time with Jesus throughout the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, no. Maybe they say prayer before they eat food, um, but that's pretty much the extent of it. Uh, they like to argue uh, theology, but they don't have much time for focusing on Jesus. Uh, these people are religious, but they're not spiritual. Do you know there's a difference between being spiritual? It's possible to be religious without being spiritual. And these contrasts that I've just been going through describe people who are religious, but they're not spiritual. Religious people tend to be critical and judgmental. Spiritual people tend to be redemptive and forgiving. Um, religious people tend to be exclusive, kind of like it's us and them, us and them. Um, but spiritual people are inclusive. We're all part of the family of God. We're all children of the Heavenly Father. Religious people tend to be high on standards and low on knowing and loving Jesus. So as long as they keep the rules, they think everything's cool, they don't have any concern, they just don't really have any time for him. Not really. And Jesus revealed what the last church in the book of Revelation, what the last church at the end of time is going to be very like, very much like. And when he's referring to the last church, he's not referring necessarily to a specific denomination. He's referring to all denominations. Currently, the right, just even now as we speak, I believe we are in the last days of Earth's history. I don't see how, I don't see how um, Earth can continue going at the rate it's going. Things are exponentially going out of control. If someone had told you three years ago that the entire world was going to be brought to a grinding halt, would you have believed it? You would have said, this is science fiction. This is crazy. No, no, that's something that Hollywood would generate in some horror film or some thriller. But no, the world's not going to. But yet the entire world was brought to a grinding halt in less than two weeks and stayed halted for two years. And ever since then, things keep getting worse and worse. And when you ask somebody, why this change, why that change? Well, they say, well, since COVID. Have you ever noticed that? Um, all, the, all the changes that they made, call it, this is COVID. We did this because of COVID. But now COVID's gone, but the changes haven't quit. So they still, so like, for example, the airlines they had, we just flew down here. They used to have a lot more um, services they provided. But then they cut all their services during COVID. Now what? Guess what? 
COVID's no longer the issue, but the services haven't come back. And same thing in stores. It just goes on down the line. All the services removed. Um, no reason to have them removed anymore, but now they don't put them back. It just keeps moral decline, moral decay. You watch what's going on. Have you seen what's happening? Things that just two or three years ago, people, it's almost, it's almost, currently it's almost popular to be part of a rebellious movement. It's almost like that's the good guys are the ones who are the protesters and who are out to try and, you know, change uh, through violence and protests. It's just, it's a puzzling thing. It's a puzzling, puzzling thing. And the world just seems to be getting more and more uh, like it can't keep going on like this, you know. Uh, the the economy go down the list of all the different things you look around you uh, it just it just it seems to me that we have to be nearing uh, where this world is wearing out you know in the bible it says the world in the last days will wear, grow old and wear old and wax cold like a garment and jesus is referring to this church that's just at the end of time just before he comes and he says you look good on the outside but on the inside you're full of corruption and dead men's bones now <clears throat> unfortunately Many people in churches have thought that the way that we get a church hot is by raising standards. If we can just raise the standards, we can get people plugged in and, and, and we'll, have a, we'll create a, a hot uh, a membership. Uh, I remember my father, when I was just a kid, he pastored a church in Colorado and uh, he was a young preacher at the time. And they were having a midweek meeting. They called it the prayer meeting on Wednesday night. And at the Wednesday night prayer meeting, the church was wanting to study the subject of revival. So they were looking into God's word and they were talking about and thinking about and praying about and reading about revival. And then somebody said, you know what? If we want to have a revival, we should just raise the standards. We just need to hold the ladder, hold the, hold the banner, hold the bar higher and have people strive for, for, for a higher standard. And so they said, well, what, is that, what would that look like? And interestingly enough, one of the things that they came up with as they were trying to think of what it looked like if we had a higher standard, they said, well, I think we shouldn't have any kind of jewelry. I think if we have anything that's shiny or bright or glittery, that that just draws attention to ourselves. So if we're serious about having revival, we should get rid of anything that glistens or shines or sparkles because, you know, after all, we want revival. So they, they all determined that, that they wanted to do. And my father, who was the young pastor at the time, he, he didn't know exactly how to respond to all of that, but he thought, well, you know, I don't have anything that's glittery or sparkly, so I guess I'm okay. I'll just kind of go with the flow. Well, he was eating at a potluck after church one day, uh, and he was sitting across from a member, and the member looked over at him and said, Pastor Vendon, he said, um, what is that on your tie? He had a tie. And he had a thing called a tie clasp, holding the tie. They said, what is that, Pastor? What is that on your tie? And my dad looked down. He said, what do you mean? They said, well, that, that shiny thing on your tie. What's that? Oh, he said, it's a tie clasp. They said, well, why are you wearing a tie clasp? Well, he said, I don't like to lean forward and have my tie drop into the soup. You know, it kind of keeps things from getting soiled. And, and they go, but, but isn't it exciting to have some glitter and some shine to it? My dad said, well, I hadn't really thought about that. They said, well, I thought you were into revival. Don't you want a revival? Well, yeah, I want a revival. Well, you know, you could be uh, holding up the revival with the, you know, the progress of our a revival with your shiny clasp tie. And so my father, he didn't want to be a stumbling block. And so he took off his tie clasp and put it in his pocket. And from that point forward, his tie would fall into the soup. But he just thought, you know, if, if, if paying for the um, cleaning bill to get my ties cleaned is just part of the price to pay for revival, then I'll pay the price for revival. And so, you know, he began to live that way. But one morning, while well, he was, after he gotten out of the shower at home and was getting ready for the day, he noticed sitting on the counter, my mother had a number of bobby pins. Do you know what bobby pins are? Have you ever heard of bobby pins? Yeah, there were some bobby pins on the counter. And my dad looked down at those, and all of a sudden, a little ding went off in his mind. And he picked up one of those bobby pins, they are black, and he tried sliding it over his tie. And it worked, it held his tie in place, and it was black, he couldn't, couldn't hardly notice the dark color there. And so he thought, okay, okay, got that covered, no more dirty ties. Um, so a few weeks later, he's at potluck, and a member across the table says, Pastor Vinan, what is that on your tie? 
And he looked down at the little black bobby pin. Oh, by the way, he had also discovered that there were different colored bobby pins. And if he had on a red tie, he wore a red bobby pin. If it was a blue tie, he wore a blue bobby pin. So he was pretty excited about how he could make a match the tie, you know. So anyway, they said, what is that on your, on your tie, Pastor Vinden? And he said, well, it's a bobby pin. And they said, what, a bobby pin? Why are you wearing a bobby pin? And he said he suddenly felt very proud and very pious. And he said with kind of an air of piety, because I believe in revival and I don't want to wear anything that shines or glitters. And he said he was so proud of himself that suddenly he realized, because in the Bible Jesus talked about a man, he said the latter state of that man was worse than the first. In the Bible Jesus said, and my dad suddenly realized, you know, I have some problems here. Uh, now I'm proud of how I am not wearing anything that's shiny or glittery. And pride, by the way, is what started the entire sin problem in the universe. Recall Lucifer? The, the, the sin problem originated in the, youth, in the universe not over something that glittered. It, it originated over pride and arrogance, right? So my dad realized he had a bigger problem than before. Now, I'm not in favor of lowering church standards. That's not my goal. Um, but I just want to point out that raising standards is not what brings on revival. Raising standards is focusing on the outside of the cup. And it's a few moments ago we read that Jesus said, you don't, you don't just work on the outside of the cup. You can make it look pretty nice on the outside, but the inside can still be full of corruption. And if I'm just working on raising standards, then I'm, working, I'm focusing on externals rather than internals. That's the very problem that the church of Laodicea is known for. Jesus says what we want to do is we want transformation from the inside out. So check it out, Matthew chapter 23, up here on the screen. Jesus said again to that group we were looking at a moment ago, he said, woe to you Pharisees and you religious leaders. He calls them hypocrites. You are so careful to polish the outside of the cup. You've raised the standards and you removed all the glitter and shine. But the inside is still foul with extortion and greed, and in my father's case, with pride and arrogance. Inside, still a problem. Blind Pharisees, says Jesus. Don't you guys get it? Don't you see, he says. First cleanse the inside of the cup, and then the whole cup will be clean. First the inside, then the whole cup will be clean. So the first part of the message to the church of Laodicea was what we called a rebuke. He said, we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. But the good thing about God is he never points out a problem without giving us a solution. He doesn't just leave us there and say, shame on you. No, he says, now let me tell you how you can fix this. And so now on top of the rebuke to the church of Laodicea, we have the counsel to the church of Laodicea. And the counsel reads like this in verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold. Remember they said, we are rich and we are increased with goods. We don't need anything. He says, I counsel you. Here's my advice. Buy from me gold that's been refined in the fire so you can be really rich. And buy from me some white clothes to wear. And it continues. Hold it over your head and angle backwards. White clothes so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Now, people who have studied prophetic literature in Scripture understand that these three symbols that he talks about, gold, white raiment, and isaph, in prophecy, stand for some very specific things. The gold represents faith and love. In prophetic literature, gold represents faith and love. Um, the white robe in prophetic literature in the Scriptures represents Jesus covering us us with his righteousness, his robe of righteousness. That's what that represents, being covered so that when God looks at us, he sees us as though he's seen Jesus. And he's very pleased with Jesus, and so he's pleased with us as well. Christ's robe of righteousness. And the third element, the eye salve, that represents spiritual discernment. It, it represents being able to understand and see and to think spiritually. And, and Jesus told Nicodemus that's not possible without the Holy Spirit. He said, to, he said to Nicodemus, spiritual things require spiritual eyeglasses, if you will, spiritual discernment. And so Jesus is saying, here's what you need. You need gold, that's faith and love. You need my robe of righteousness, and you need the eye salve of the Holy Spirit. 
what he's really saying, if you think about it, his counsel is that we need a closer walk with him. That's what his counsel is. We need to have a personal relationship with him. We need to know him, not just know about him. Remember a few moments ago I asked, is it possible to know about him without knowing him? The answer is yes. And he's saying the solution to being lukewarm, how do you become hot, has to do with a deep, personal, meaningful relationship with Jesus. Something more than saying prayer before I eat food and showing up in church once a week. Um, I have saw a bumper sticker that said, seven days without Jesus makes one week. W-E-A-K, right? Just showing up in church once a week doesn't make me a Christian. Does it? Just sitting in a garage doesn't make me a car, does it? Just sitting in a church doesn't make me a Christian. There's something more. And Jesus is wanting the church of Laodicea to understand there's something more. When Jesus comes, I pray it soon. You know how many, have you heard the expression, the year of our Lord? Have you ever heard that expression? We often, I mean, people who aren't even Christians Refer to, you know, uh, they'll give you a date and then they follow it with the year of our Lord. Well, I would love it if this year, 2024, was the year of our Lord. That would be a wonderful thing, wouldn't it be? Anyway, when Jesus comes, whichever year ends up being the year of our Lord and refer, referring to his return, when Jesus comes, if you read in the scriptures about the second coming, there's not going to be any lukewarm people. Are you aware of that? the middle group, disappear. There's only two groups when Jesus comes. There's only the hot and cold. There's the righteous or the wicked. There's the wheat and the tares. There's the sheep and the goats. There's the wise and the foolish. In Scripture, just two groups at the very end, just two. So something happens to the middle group. Just before Jesus returns, something happens to the middle group because there's only two groups when he comes back. Right now, the majority of the Christian churches around the world, the membership for the majority, my, my denomination as well as all the others, the majority are in the middle. Believe it or not, the majority are lukewarm. They go through the motions, but they don't have meaningful daily time alone with Jesus for the purpose of becoming better acquainted with him one-on-one. -on -one. But just before he comes, something happens to the middle group. They go all the way one direction or the other. They go hot or cold. The middle group disappears. They go hot or cold all over. When I was a little boy, my grandfather on my mom's side taught me a nursery rhyme. Many of you probably heard it before. It goes like this. There was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. When she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was horrid. That was the little nursery rhyme that my grandfather taught me. and I don't know, I guess I got kind of a kick out of it and learned it and memorized it. But <clears throat> the, the, the middle group, they either go very, very good, hot, or they go horrid, very, very cold. And if you have any, if your eyes are open at all, currently, you are seeing a great polarization happening around our world. The hot are getting hotter, if you will, and the cold are getting colder, if you will. I mentioned this last night. I'm going to mention it again right now. We live When we're not traveling, we live in a little kind of a farm town called Walla Walla, Washington. It's kind of out in the middle of almost nowhere. And you know what? We have a Home Depot in that town, and we have a Walmart. Those are the two stores. Other than that, we, that's about it. Um, and do you know what? <clears throat> Both those stores in this little farm town, have put more than half of their products behind bars. You have to seek a um, an employee in the store. Once you know what you want, you have to go get an employee to come unlock the, the door so you can get the thing because it's behind a bar. Pardon me? Yeah, you have to pay for it first too. Make sure that you're not going to, you know. Um, just here, just here in, um, in in the Phoenix area. Yesterday, uh, two of our suitcases when we flew down, the the, the people who were handling the suitcases, uh, whether it was at Seattle or Phoenix, I don't know which place, but one of the two places. This is the only two places our suitcases were. 
Seattle airport or the Phoenix airport, one of our suitcases came, when we got it, completely split open. Just, it was a hard shell suitcase. Completely split open, just pew, all the way down the whole side, just pew. Um, and the other one, the bottom where the rollers are, completely split, just pew. Um, so we had to go in, went, went looking for suitcases. Went looking to replace those suitcases yesterday. And you know what? Every suitcase in the store had a device on it that they had to remove before we went out the door of the store. I said, what would happen if we just paid for that and gone out the door? She said, oh, you wouldn't get out the door. We have a security guard standing at the door. And if you stood through the door, you would have set off the alarm for suitcases. Do you know what? I was in a Walmart. I won't tell you what town it was in, but it wasn't that far from here. And they had security devices in men's underwear. If you tried to steal the underwear, you set off the alarm. Margie says, don't keep dwelling on this. <laughs> Do you guys realize what my point is? Something's happening in our world that our merchants can't trust people to be honest and forthright. And so because they can't trust them, they have to put everything under lock and key and hide devices in what you're buying so that if you try to sneak out the store with it, it goes off. There's something wrong with that picture. And I'm saying if your eyes are open at all, you're seeing that this moral decline is accelerating. And the unrighteous are becoming more and more unrighteous. But at the same time, people who are interested in spiritual things and in Jesus are getting more and more excited about him and his return as the solution to the problem that we're seeing in our declining world. So these two groups are forming. And I think it's pretty exciting because remember, just before Jesus comes, there's only how many groups? Just two. So if you see the two groups becoming more and more apparent, instead of going, oh, whoa, this is bad news, we can actually go, yes. It looks like we're approaching the time where Jesus comes because there's only two groups. It looks like there's only two groups. It's exciting times to be in, I think. Romans 9.28 says that God's going to finish the work. And when he does, he's going to cut it short in righteousness. There's coming a time where God says, basically, okay, y'all, here we come. You know, when we used to play hide and seek as kids, they have, when you count before you go, at the end of the counting, you get to 100, you say, ready or not, here I come. I'm just picturing heaven, and I'm picturing Jesus looking down, and he's seeing the two groups becoming more and more apparent. And there's going to come a point where he says, ready or not, here I come. And he's going to cut it short in righteousness because the Lord's going to make a short work upon the earth. As God finishes his work, this great polarization takes place. And I'm seeing it happening around me. And if your eyes are open, as I said, you're seeing it around you as well. What's going to happen? I said the hot are going to become hotter and the cold are going to become colder. John 4, 23. Jesus said, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. And I want to just, just talk, stop here for just a minute. Uh, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. This is that woman at the well. And, and um, Jesus offers her living water. Remember, first of all, he asks her for a drink. And she says, you know, why are you talking to me? You know, Jews don't talk to Samaritans. Furthermore, men don't talk to women. So why are you asking me any help for any favors? And he says to her, lady, if you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a favor and I'd give you living water. And she goes, living water? He goes, yeah. He says, the water you're drinking right here, you get thirsty again. But the water I could give you quenches your thirst. It quenches the thirst you have for something more and something better. She goes, wow. She says, I like some of that. How do I get it? If you remember the story, then he says to her, well, go get your husband. And then come back and I'll tell you both at the same time. And then she says, oh, well, there's no hope for me because I don't have a husband. And then Jesus says to her, lady, you got that right. You've had five husbands. And the guy you're living with right now is not your husband. So you were speaking truth when you said that. Well, then she says, because she's never met him before. So how does he know this stuff? So then she says, whoa, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. Like, she's pretty smart, right? She's like, he just said all this stuff about me. He must be, 
you must be a prophet. Uh, if, if you're a prophet, she says, could we change the subject? <laughs> could we talk about something besides me? Um, let's talk about worship, okay? Because like the Samaritans say that God's looking for a certain kind of worship and, and, and the Jews, they say that the only place you can have legitimate worship is at the temple in Jerusalem. And so you, can you tell me if you're a prophet, what kind of, what kind of worship is God looking for? And this is where Jesus answered. We just saw it on the screen. He said, I'll tell you what, what kind of worship God's looking for. He's looking for people who worship him in spirit. That would have to do with your heart. And in truth, that would have to do with your mind. In other words, he's saying, I want all of you engaged, not just part of you. Is it possible to just have head knowledge without having a heart relationship? Yeah, yeah. If I just have it here, but I don't have it here, my heart's not in it, then the relationship is missing. In order for there to be a meaningful relationship, my heart has to be in it too, right? My heart has to be in it too. And he said the kind of worship the Father is looking for is people who worship with spirit and in truth. Um, if you had a rowboat and you only had one oar, you'd go in circles, wouldn't you? Unless you kept going, you know, like this. But if you have a rowboat and you have two oars in the water, then you make progress. And Jesus is telling this lady, my, my father, the father in heaven, God, he's looking for people to have both oars in the water. Earlier, Jesus said, it's not enough to look good on the outside. That would be one oar in the water. I know the truth. I have the truth. I understand the truth. I know the doctrines. I have the proof texts. I can prove what's right and what's wrong from Scripture. I've got it figured out. Just ask me. I can give you the facts. Well, he says, that's not enough. I want your heart involved, too. I'm looking for a relationship. I'm not looking for just simply head knowledge. I'm not looking for just being able to prove your church is right. I'm looking for a personal connection. I'm looking for a relationship. I'm looking for your heart to be dialed in too, not just your mind, both of them. And if you're both in, then it's no longer a cup that looks good on the outside, but it's got rotten on the inside. It's good on the inside and the outside. That's what he's looking for. That's the solution to the church of Laodicea. Well, what does his counsel Say, here's the solution, he says. A relationship with me, faith and love, Holy Spirit giving you spiritual eyeglasses, my righteousness instead of your own, a relationship with me. That's the solution to the problem of the church of Laodicea. That's the counsel he gave us. Now, I'm going to just read you one little sentence that comes from a, um, a book entitled Early Writings. It's referring to a shaking that takes place just before God comes, before Jesus returns. There's this shaking. The Bible talks about it too. A shaking time where the good, where the middle goes one way or the other during the shaking time. And it says here that the shaking that causes them to go one way or the other is brought on by the straight testimony which is called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Once again, the counsel was you need a personal relationship with Jesus. That was the counsel. And this says what causes people to get shook up in the churches is the emphasis on the counsel. Now think with me for just a minute. Can you think of any reason why people ought get shook up about talking about having a relationship with Jesus? Why would that shake anybody up? Doesn't that just seem like... Who wouldn't want a relationship with Jesus? And yet it says the counsel, which was you need a relationship, is what shakes the church. Now think about it. The only reason that the counsel of having a personal relationship with Jesus would shake people up is if they didn't have one and they were just dialed in with head knowledge, but they didn't have a heart relationship. And someone comes along and says, this is something that's important. More, You need both. And they'd get a little bit nervous and they'd go, wait a minute, are you telling me that, that I, I don't have enough? Are you telling me that just being able to know what the truth is isn't enough? They start to feel insecure. Um, I, I won't tell you where it was, but I, I once pastored a church. And there, there was a group of people who wrote a letter of complaint about me as the pastor to my boss, who was uh, uh, in charge of the area or the region or the conference where I worked. Um, he was called the conference president. 
and there was about see, about eight people. They were all leaders in my church. In fact, they were elders in the church. They sat on the church board and all that. And they sent this letter to my boss, my conference president, complaining about me, but they sent me a copy of it too. Sometimes people send off letters and they don't sign their names, but these people sign their names. All eight of them, they sign their names. And um, they sent me, like I said, they sent me a copy. And this is what the letter said. It said to my, to my boss, they named his name. They said, you know, uh, dear pastor so-and-so or whatever. They said, we are getting very tired down here. And then they named the church where I was pastoring. We're getting very tired here at this church of having all of the sermons forever and always about Jesus. That's what they wrote. Then they went on to say, we would like some good old-fashioned Seventh-day Adventist preaching for a change. That's what they wrote. And they signed their names. Now think about it just for a minute with me. Put your thinking caps on, as we used to say when we were in grade school. What, what did they think good old-fashioned Seventh-day Adventist preaching looked like? What did they think? Well, they had just said they didn't want to hear any more about who? Jesus. So that would imply that their concept of good old-fashioned Seventh-day Adventist preaching doesn't include Jesus, right? Or they wouldn't say that's what we want instead. Now, ask yourself a question. Why would there be church leaders who don't want to hear any more about Jesus? Doesn't that puzzle you? Do you know what my conference president wrote them back? He wrote them back, and he sent me a copy of the letter that he wrote them. And I really thought it was interesting what he wrote. He said to them, you know, I am praying for the day when every church in my conference has the problem your church has. That's what he wrote back. In other words, I want more and more about Jesus. I looked at the church bulletin for today, and one of the songs we're going to sing for the church worship hour is more about Jesus. And I can just imagine that the conference president was saying, we want more. But why would these church leaders not want more about Jesus? Here's why. They had been substituting head knowledge and correct theology for a relationship with Christ. And that's no substitute. It doesn't matter how amazing the facts are. If you don't know the friend, the facts aren't going to save anybody. You follow what I'm saying? You've got to know the friend. God, who you get to know the friend as well. And these people, the church of Laodicea, the counsel that they're being given is, open your heart to receive the friend. Don't just work on the outside, making sure you don't wear tie tacks. Work on heart relationship, because that's where it all comes down. Well, this brings me to my final story. There are people who sometimes say, you said open your heart to Jesus, but what if I don't have anything to offer? I, I, I feel like I, I'm kind of a failure when it comes to spiritual things. I don't have anything to offer. And it puts me in mind of this last little story I want to tell you. Years ago, up in the state of Oregon, there was a group, uh, a family, a family, little Seventh-day Adventist family who was on vacation. And they were staying, and they had a little vacation, small little vacation trailer towing behind their car. And on a Friday afternoon, as almost sundown, they pulled into the campground. They were scheduled to stay for the weekend. Now, they were Seventh-day Adventist Christians, and they made a point of, of remembering the fourth commandment, which talks about on the Sabbath to rest from your labor and so on. So they just barely got their trailer set up and everything ready to go. And then they recognized and realized they don't have any food for the weekend. But the sun is already going down and they didn't want to go down to the market and go shopping now. Now that Sabbath had come on. So the father said to the family, he said, here's the plan. He said, we're only about nine miles away from a little Seventh-day Adventist church here, not too far from our campground. So tomorrow we will go to that church and they always have a potluck at those churches. And so we'll just pig out at the potluck and that'll get us, that'll get us through the, the Sabbath hours. And then after the Sabbath hours are over, we'll go to a grocery store and fill up our, and get food. So they said, okay, well, you know, that's what the solution is. 
So the next morning, they all show up at this little Seventh-day Adventist church. And of course, they're campers. And so they're wearing their old, you know, camping clothing and so on. And they figured that wearing the camping clothing would make it more obvious that they were guests. And so they get special treatment as guests, you know. Anyway, uh, you can imagine their horror when during the welcome and announcement time, the pastor said, we, we regret to inform you that because of some problems we had with the plumbing in our kitchen, we've had to cancel the potluck for today. There'll be no potluck, but we'll begin again. Potluck will begin next week. And the kids all look at their father like, oh yeah, I thought you said we were going to pick out. What, what are we supposed to do for food today? And the father looks over at them and he gives them a little like sign like this, like, no worries, no worries, because we look like visitors. And there's going to be so many people inviting us to come home for lunch after the service today that we're going to have to pick and choose which one we're going to go to. You just watch. That's what they do here. They ask people out when they see visitors. So don't worry, no worries. So the, the, the service ends. And they're in the foyer, and they're slow to go because they're waiting for that invitation, right? And so they're kind of standing around, and they're looking at the bulletin boards, and they're uh, observing things, and nobody's asking them out. And, and finally, a little lady comes over, and she goes, are you guys visitors? And father looks over at the kids and winks, you know? <laughs> Here we go. And then he goes, yes, we are. Oh, she said, well, what brings you to our area? Oh, he said, we're camping. We're on vacation. Oh, she said, where are you camping? Oh, they said a little campground just outside here of town. It's, you know, Agate Falls campground or whatever. And she goes, no kidding. What's your campsite? And, oh, we're in campsite number 17. She says, great, I'm coming for lunch. <laughs> and the kids look at their father like, oh, that worked real good. And she says, how, how soon will, will you be ready? He says, well, as soon as we can. And, and, and they got in their car and they went back to their campground. And the kids are going, yeah, pig out, huh, Dad? Pig out. Well, this is certainly not working very well. And they get to their little trailer. And uh, Mom and Dad go in. And he goes, what are we going to do? And she says, all I have is one can of beans. He goes, well, let's mash them up. And let's put a bunch of water in there and heat it up. And we'll call it soup, you know? And so they're mashing up the beans and putting water in and stirring them, putting on the burner, a little camper fire there on their, in, their, in their little trailer. And, and, and he's going, I can't believe this. And the kids are going, this isn't the way it was supposed to turn out. And, and as they're doing all this, he's looking out the window. He goes, oh, no. Oh, no, here comes the lady. She just drove in, and she's got a station wagon. There's five people in the station wagon with her. Oh, my word. Oh, no, no, no. He says that's not the end of it. There's four more cars coming in behind them. Add some more water to the soup, you know. We're in big trouble. And there they are sweating bullets. And all of a sudden, he goes, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Because they open up the trunks of their cars, and they start pulling out entrees and salads and bread and oh my word all kinds of veggies and good things and drinks and desserts and dad says to his wife he says throw the soup down the drain we are going to pig out right the reason I love that story is because when the lady came she brought everything with her and there are people, Laodiceans, people who have simply been going through the motions. They hear Jesus saying, it can be better. We can have a deep relationship. Open your heart. I'm knocking and I'll come in and we'll fellowship. And they might say it first, but what if I don't have anything to offer? Good news. You don't have to have anything to offer because when Jesus comes in, he brings everything with him. And that's the counsel to the church of Laodicea in the third chapter of Revelation. So once again, last night we started off Revelation. Jesus is looking for friends and he's saying, I haven't forgotten you and I'm going to come for you. And, you know, and now we're seeing it again. Revelation three, he's saying we can have a relationship and that's what I want more and more of. And I know that's what you want more and more of, too. So let's have a little prayer and then we'll have a short break before the 11 o'clock service. Lord Jesus, thank you that you bring everything with you when you come. Thank you that um, it can be better. We look around us at the world horizontally and we see a lot of trouble going on. But if we change our focus and look vertically, we see that we have hope. We see that you've promised to come back for your friends. You've promised to set all the things that are wrong right, to make them right. 
And um, not only that, you have made it clear that you want to um, have a relationship, a personal relationship with each one of us. So Lord, teach us know, to know you better more and more and to um, be attracted by the things of earth, I'm excuse me, by the things of heaven so that the things of earth will go strangely dim. That's my prayer for myself and for everybody here. In your name, amen. So there's a short little break here, maybe eight, 10 minutes, 15 at the most, I suppose. I don't know, but we'll be starting 11 o'clock service very shortly. So you can stretch, get a little fresh air, get a drink, use the restroom, and then we'll begin in about 10, 10 or 12 minutes.